the next patient you are going to anesthetize has been shot in the chest, he's awake with a low blood pressure, what are you going to do? My name is uh, Jacob Steinmetz and I'm an anesthesiologist working in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, both pre-hospitally as well as in-hospitally. First of all, I'd like to declare that I have no conflicts of interest. There's no money involved in this. So um, my talk today is first a little bit about anesthetizing patients or not. And when you anesthetize the patients, which drugs should you use? And then all about the other stuff that you do during anesthesia for a trauma patient. Whether or not to anesthetize a patient, that is the real question. Obviously, you do relieve uh, pain for, tra uh, for trauma patients, so uh, when you anesthetize them, you uh, reduce the pain and you also reduce the stress uh, the, the trauma patient has. And obviously, you give anesthesia in order to facilitate different kinds of manipulations. It can be very painful being a trauma patient, being moved around the scene of the accident and going to a stretcher and off the stretcher again, and obviously before intubation and surgery. So you do need anesthesia. But if we look to the Bible of anesthesia, the Miller's anesthesia, uh, they actually say that the dose of anesthetic must be decreased in the presence of trauma hemorrhage, including no anesthetic at all, in patients with life-threatening hypovolemia. So they actually uh, give you a, an advice that you should not give anesthesia su to certain patients. Well, this paper disagrees with that. It's a, it's a pretty old paper from uh, London, England, where they assessed nearly 500 patients that were intubated um, after trauma without the use of uh, anesthetics. And they found that only one of those 500 patients survived. So they conclude that it, it is probably a value uh, that is very doubtful using no anesthesia at all for intubations. A more recent study from last year, also from the London HEMS, um, looked at patients that were um, both hypotensive, but also were awake at the scene of the accident. So they had a GCS of 13 to 15. Those are the kind of patients that you do not necessarily have to anesthetize. And they found um, that the patients that were intubated, although they were awake initially, had a, an odds ratio of three of dying. Um, and so it's an association in this observational study. They also found, as you can see, the severe hypovolemia had a high odds ratio of dying. So obviously, this is confounding by indication, saying that the more procedures you do uh, are the patients that are more severely injured. And that's a big limitation of this study because actually they did not adjust for the injury severity score in, uh, in those two groups of patients. And they, they um, were not comparable in terms of hypotension interventions and longer unseen time. So those are all well-known predictors of mortality in the trauma population. But it still gives you an idea that sometimes you should be careful using anesthesia. So we have an observational study that was uh, just presented a couple of hours ago today, uh, where we showed that patients that were intubated after different kinds of drugs had a better survival rate than the patients that were an intubated without any use of drugs. So again, it's an observational study. They are more severely injured, but it still gives you an idea that it's not uh, the, the, the truth to all sayings, uh, using no drugs at all. But when you anesthetize patients, obviously in the trauma setting, you need to be aware of what happens next. So uh, obviously this guy is trapped under a truck. You can see him lying there. You can see his left leg uh, sticking out. And um, so when you provide analgesia or anesthesia to this patient, you do not want to lose his airway. You want him to maintain an open airway and you also want to have blood products available. Actually, in this uh, scenario, we started giving blood transfusion before he was retracted from under the truck. So you need to be certain what to do next after you provide anesthesia.
Sometimes you can have uh, more soft indications for uh, providing anesthesia to the trauma patient. This patient a couple of months ago I had, he stabbed himself in the stomach with his knife and uh, he used to be agitated, but he was very calm at the moment. So in some scenarios, I would definitely have anesthetized him uh, only to transport him to the hospital due to my own safety. But in this case, I had a, um, a policeman that uh, held the knife in place while we were driving the patient to the hospital. But if you choose to anesthetize, the real question, which drugs should you use? Well, there's a number of drugs out there that you can use, but there's not a lot of uh, level one evidence for it, actually. There's one uh, known, well-known paper, it's a randomized control trial published in The Lancet 10 years ago. And uh, it's a French study. They uh, studied more than 600 patients needing emergency intubation. And they, um, the primary outcome of the study was the SOFA score in the two groups that were either randomized with an induction agent using etomidate versus ketamine. So half of each. They did not find any significant differences uh, in the primary outcome assessment. But I think uh, this uh, survival uh, curve is uh, pretty interesting. Actually, it shows that the green curve uh, resembling the ketamine group uh, sh uh, appears to have a better survival rate than the etomidate group. But if you go into detail, you can see that the hazard ratio was 1.2. It was not significant. And uh, those were all emergency uh, patients that you had, but only 100 of the patients were trauma patients, actually. And it seemed that the point estimate uh, for, for the trauma patients actually uh, pointed towards being better uh, survival after a tumor But they were not significant. All the point estimates were not significant. What was significant, though, was that the ad adrenal insufficiency in the patients that received etomidate was um, uh, significantly higher in the group that received etomidate. And that is a well-known side effect to the etomidate, and that is why it is not um, used uh, commonly, at least in Europe. Uh, you use it in only a few places, and it's due to the, uh, sorry, the side effects of uh, adrenal insufficiency. And interestingly enough, they did not uh, find any differences in intubation conditions. But the next study actually did uh, find that. So they, um, that was an historical uh, cohort study showing that in 2007 and 8, they uh, used etomidate and SOX uh, for intubation of trauma patients. And then five years after, in 2012 and 13, they used ketamine, fentanyl, and rocuronium. So they, pr uh, they found that uh, the last uh, way of doing things, the, the fentanyl, ketamine, and rocuronium provided better intubation conditions as opposed to the older ways of, of treating patients. I think personally that the, uh, the last group with the ketamine, fentanyl, and rocuronium were better anesthetized. They provided fentanyl and opioid for analgesia on top of ketamine, which is an uh, analgesia in itself. Whereas uh, etomidate does not have an analgesic uh, effect, so they were less anesthetized, hence providing worse conditions for intubation. Um, we did a systematic review of um, induction agents for a trauma population. And it was published uh, this year. We assessed, uh, well, at least we screened 1,700 studies, and we only found four fulfilling uh, the, what we aim for. We wanted to look at the adult trauma population uh, where they uh, compared ketamine to another uh, type of induction agent. And one of the studies were randomized. That's the study described uh, um, from Lancet a couple of slides ago from France. And then the three others were observational studies. In our systematic review, we did not find any indication of ketamine being neither worse or better uh, for uh, providing induction to the trauma population. So there are no evidence out there suggesting that ketamine should be better. Our observational study just presented a couple of hours ago uh, did not find any differences uh, in uh, mortality either 
when you compare ketamine to all the other types of induction agents. And that study was carried out both in Denmark and in uh, Boston, the United States. And I want, want to mention a few uh, mechanisms for ketamine because it's a preferred drug for many emergency physicians. So first of all, the reason for being more stable when it comes to blood pressure is that it has a vasopressor effect. But contrary to what many people believe is that it is actually still negatively inotropic, just like all the other drugs except for etomidate. So the reason why you have a nice blood pressure after you provide ketamine is only the vasopressor effect. So that resembles actually giving propofol and adding uh, phenylephrine to, to, the, um, to the propofol. So that's the same effect. Um, is it neuroprotective? Well, some in vitro studies suggest that it is neuroprotective and some animal studies of monkey brains and uh, rats suggest that it is neurotoxic. So there's not a lot of evidence supporting that it is neuroprotective. There are studies uh, showing that the cerebral metabolism actually increases. And it, uh, it is logic, I think, because when you give ketamine to patients that are awake, they describe a lot of hallucinations. So you kind of put the brain on overdrive. And I think that it is not, it does not seem like a sane thing to do to put the brain that you try to protect uh, when it comes to metabolism, to put that organ on overdrive. I think you should protect it. And actually there's an animal study comparing different kinds of anesthesia for, uh, for bleeding dogs showing that the worst anesthetic you can give is ketamine. But I think it is fair to conclude that there is no single drug out there that is better than the other for induction of the acute trauma patient. So I think you should use the drug that is well known to you, that you know what, uh, what is the dosage for normal volemic uh, patients and very importantly, what is the dose for hypovolemic patients? Because basically you have a single component pharmacokinetic um, uh, model when you have a severe hypovolemia due to bleeding. You basically have a, um, a blood-brain circuit and therefore you should reduce the, um, the dose of the uh, intubation drug. You should also use less um, concentration of uh, opioids, whereas when it comes to muscle relaxants, you should use the normal dosage. Okay, so what about all the other stuff? Well, first and foremost, oxygen. We all, we all um, inhale it, 21%, but should you give more than 21% for the trauma patient under anesthesia? Well, that is also a very good question. When you um, look into the guidelines, international guidelines provided by the ATLS and the PHTLS, they say that you should provide liberal oxygen therapy for the initial phase of the trauma patient's treatment. Whatever that is, what is the initial phase? We don't know. And actually, uh, a couple of years ago, we looked into the evidence uh, behind uh, these uh, guidelines and there is no evidence out there supporting the use of supplemental oxygen therapy for trauma patients. But it's still in the guidelines, so I recommend you do as the guidelines tell you. Besides of that, you should um, beware of the lethal triad, the triad of death. The, this is a self-propagating vicious cycle where you have hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. And those are all three components that you want to avoid. Well, you can use permissive hypertension. You, uh, you decrease the bleeding. There's not a lot of evidence supporting the use of permissive hypertension, but there are a couple of studies out there supporting the use of permissive hypertension, at least when it comes to a very short-term assessments. The 24-hour mortality is lower when you use the permissive hypertension. And uh, so you should, um, you should um, aim for a lower blood pressure. You should not normalize the blood pressure. You should not aim for blood pressure as in the elective cases. And uh, actually this is um, old knowledge because in 1994 there is a classical study um, published by Bickel in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine where they assessed 600 penetrating torso trauma patients. So 
half the group uh, received immediate resuscitation, meaning uh, uh, crystalloids and IV access in the pre-hospital setting, and the other half of those 600 patients, they received delayed resuscitation. So they did not receive an IV access and they did not have crystalloids in the pre-hospital setting. And they found that the survival rate was better in the patients that did not have an IV access and did not have crystalloids in the pre-hospital setting. So that is old knowledge. It's 25 years old and still there's a lot of people giving crystalloids in the pre-hospital setting for trauma patients, which you should refrain from. In the more modern uh, therapy, what should you do instead? Well, this is a recent study from last year published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they assessed 500 trauma patients with hypotension being a systolic blood pressure below 90. And they found that if you had thought plasma instead of crystalloids, you had a better survival rate. So you can see that significantly higher survival rate in those patients that received plasma in the pre-hospital helicopter setting. So that is good, solid evidence suggesting that you should give blood products early. And obviously, a well-known study, CRASH-2 trial from The Lancet, nine years ago, assessing 20,000 pa 20, patients where half of them received tranexamic acid if you suspected bleeding. In trauma patients, they showed an all-cause mortality reduction when you got tranexamic acid. So you should give it as early as possible, but preferably before three hours after the trauma. And a couple of interesting studies out there also suggesting during anesthesia that the mode of ventilation can actually affect the blood loss during operations. So this is a study from South Korea, 56 patients are in spine surgery, and they showed that the volume controlled ventilation affected in more blood loss than if you had pressure control ventilation. So the tidal volume was the same, but the two different modes of ventilation strategies was actually um, resulting in difference in blood loss. And that is supported by a French study where they showed that in 79 liver resection patients, um, they had less bleeding if you provided the lung protected ventilation as shown on the right column. Okay, so what are the take home messages from this talk? Well, first of all, I, I think that it's fair to say that the level evidence, level one evidence in this area is very sparse, but I think um, there's no evidence for uh, using a superior anesthetic drug as opposed to other drugs, so you should use the ones that you are familiar with, but it's very important, no matter what drug you use, that you reduce the dosage. You should be careful providing anesthesia for a patient with hypovolemia. You should wait until you have blood product uh, transfusions readily available and you have surgeons uh, available for uh, providing surgical control of the bleeding. You should be aware that the ventilation and the blood pressure regulation in itself can increase the bleeding and you should be aware that the lethal triad of death um, is very important and you should avoid all three components. And you should use blood uh, product components and tranexamic acid as early as possible. Thanks very much for listening in.